Good morning. As I noticed in the last week, uh, we will talk about the temporal mandibular dysfunction or temporal mandibular joint today and continue the, continue the discussion into the examination of the analysis of occlusion. Many terms are used to describe this condition, for example, mandibular dysfunction or craniomandibular dysfunction or temporal mandibular joint dysfunction or myofascial pain dysfunction syndrome, muscle hyperactivity disorder, and so on. This illustrates the fact that the condition is poorly understood and that there are many suggested explanations for it. Some explanations blame the joint itself for symptoms. Others, the muscles of mastication and their control systems, and others, blames the occlusion, which in turn affects the control system, and again, in turn, the muscles and the joint. Some clinicians believe that the symptoms arise mainly or entirely from psychological stress and or anxiety. The least pejorative term is therefore the temporomandibular dysfunction, which is simply used to label a common combination of symptoms, often including tenderness, pain, tensions in the muscles of mastication and pain, clicking and limitation of movements of the temporomandibular joint. In many cases, the syndrome resolved spontaneously with or without treatment. The reported incidence is higher in young adult female patients than in other groups. These two facts suggest that the condition is more commonly of functional and psychogenic origin than it is to do with irreversible physical changes in the joint themselves. Changes to occur in the joint and these can be demonstrated by conventional radiographic techniques designed for the purpose or by magnetic resonance imaging MRI, which does not involve ionizing radiation or physical invasions of the joint. When MRI is available, it is very expensive technique. It is the best way to investigate the possibility of the internal joint derangement or pathology. Confusingly, MRI surveys of the normal patients with no symptoms of TMD have shown that a significant proportion of them have displaced the discs within the temporal mandibular joint, which when such a displacement were discovered by the previous invasive techniques, which could only ethically be used on patients with symptoms were considered to be the cause of the symptoms. Undoubtedly, some of these internal joint derangements or more frank pathology of the joints do cause symptoms similar to those arising from the purely functional disorder. There are clearly cases in which the cause of the symptoms is dysfunction, others in which there is some organic, physical explanations and many where the cause is less clear. Sadly, some dentists align themselves with one or other of the rather narrow and exclusive regimes for the management of the mandibular dysfunction. This is unfortunate and unscientific. With different schools of thought about the etiology and management of the mandibular dysfunction, each supported by some but incomplete research evidence, the sensible dentist will keep an open mind. However, some lines of treatment are more interventive than others, and so it is wiser to take a conservative approach to management of the mandibular dysfunction and assume that, in the absence of the firm evidence to the contrary, most cases of mandibular dysfunctions are functional rather than organic in nature. An attractive hypothesis is that the occlusal interference produce conditioned patterns of muscles activity that avoid these interferences. This increases the basic level of muscle activity, which, when it is further increased by anxiety or stress, brings the level of muscle tension above a threshold and symptoms develop. Therefore, treatment aimed at removing the occlusal interferences is aimed at the cause of the problem rather than the symptoms. Similarly, treatment aimed at the reducing anxiety and stress is also aimed at the cause, but this should be limited to sympathy and explanation of cause. Together with a caring approach to treatment rather than in the hands of general dental practitioner, the use of drugs.
Occlusal interferences are not always easy to detect clinically because of the set of conditioned reflexes that avoid the contacts on the occlusal interference. A simple way to detect whether alteration of occlusion is likely to reduce the symptoms of mandibular dysfunction is to provide a hard acrylic bite plane covering all the surfaces of the jaw, which is sometimes called as a Michigan splint when it is made for the upper jaw and it is tanner appliance when in the lower jaw. If the symptoms improve after a few weeks of wearing up the appliance at night or all day if it is tolerated, then this is a clear indication that the occlusion has something to do with the symptoms and justifies the expenditure of further time and effort on identifying and dealing with the occlusal interferences. The acrylic bite plane should be used in this diagnostic way rather than as a long-term treatment of the condition. However, some patients, despite advices given to them, continue to wear the appliance because it has reduced their symptoms and for this reason bite planes making contact with only a limited number of anterior and posterior teeth should not be used. If they are, they will act as orthodontic appliances and produce unplanned and damaging depression or over-eruption of teeth. The treatment of occlusal interferences and the management of the mandibular dysfunction is usually fairly simple once the interference has been identified. It usually involves the occlusal adjustment by grinding selected parts of the occlusal surfaces. When this only involves the one or two clinically obvious interferences, it can be done directly in the mouth. However, if the adjustment needs to be more extensive, it is best carried out first on the articulated study cast setup in a semi-adjustable articulator, a mock adjustment to see the effects of the mandibular adjustment before irreversible changes are made to the teeth. This is not the same as the occlusal equilibration, which is recontouring of the entire occlusion to fit some preconceived idealized concept of the, what the occlusion should be. Similarly, the treatment of the mandibular dysfunction only very seldom justifies the construction of the multiple crowns or bridges. Crown and bridges may be necessary for other reasons, and if the patient had mandibular dysfunction, then this will complicate the treatment and definitive restoration should not be provided until the symptoms have been resolved. Okay, now move on to the examination and analysis of the occlusion. In most cases, it is sufficient to examine the occlusion clinically, but in more extensive occlusal reconstructions or where there is a conditioned patterns of movement preventing clinical examination, study cast should be articulated provided that the clinician understands what he is looking for there is no need to articulate study cast for the majority of individual crown and small bridges at this stage clinical examination of the occlusion the following points should be noted one any complaints of the patient may have of temporal mandibular joint pain muscle spasm or unexplained chronic dental pain number two the ease or difficulty with which the various excursions can be made voluntarily by the patient. Number three, any occlusal interferences and whether the post restorations will influence these. Number four, mobility of teeth during excursions of the mandible with the teeth in contact. Number four, the presence, angle, and smoothness of any slide from RCP to ICP. Number five, the type of lateral guidance and particularly the degree of contact in the lateral excursion of any teeth that are to be restored or the likely degree of contact for any teeth to be replaced. Number seven, the presence of any contact on the non-working side. Number eight, the location, extent, and cause of any fasting of the teeth to be restored or sign of excessive wear to restoration of teeth. Number nine, the degree of stability of occlusion and whether the proposed restorations will influence the stability. The number 10, the last, but not least, over erupted and tilted teeth, particularly if they are the teeth to be restored or if they oppose the teeth to be restored.
there are some clinical aids. The first one is articulating paper or foil. Flexible articulating paper or plastic foil of different colors may be used to mark the occlusal contacts in different excursions. For example, the ICP may be recorded in one color and the RCP in a second color. Articulating paper is rather difficult to use, having a tendency to mark the tip of cusps whether or not they are in occlusion, and often it does not register contact on the polished gold or the glazed porcelain surface. The thickness of the paper will have influence on the degree of marking that occur, and ideally it should be as thin as possible. The figure shows the selection of marking materials. The teeth are very sensitive to the thickness of the material between them and can easily detect the differences between the materials. The next is the wax. It is a very familiar material in dental clinics, especially in the prosthetic clinics. Thin, fairly soft wax with an adhesive on one side is marketed as a material for registering occlusal contacts. This is useful but rather expensive. A better alternative is to use the 0.5 mm thick, dark colored sheet wax. Occlusal restorations in this material are shown in the picture. It has advantage that can be removed from the teeth and placed over the study case to put your closer contact to be studied more closely. It can also be used in a four arch sized pieces. Areas of contact in the mouth may be marked through a perforation with a china graph pencils. The next one is the closer registration silicones. Fast setting silicon rubber material can be syringed between the teeth and the closer contacts recorded. These materials are soft initially, so offer no resistance to the closure of the mandible, which can be a problem with more viscous materials such as wax if not softened properly. The resistance felt on biting into a more viscous material may guide the mandible into different position. Once set, the silicon material is flexible but sufficiently rigid to be used as accurate intercluser record to articulate casts. It can be placed on the model to show by means of the perforations which parts of the occlusal surfaces are making contact. Because it can be replaced onto the model or the patient's teeth without damage, it is a better material than wax. The next is the plastic strips. Plastic strips may be used to test whether teeth are making contact in various excursions. The thinnest of these materials such as a shrimp stock is opaque and silver colored and is only 8 micrometers thick. The strip is placed between opposing teeth and pulled aside once a closer contact has been made. Often, two pieces are used on opposite sides of the jaw to test the symmetry of the occlusion or between the crowned teeth and its opponent and the adjacent teeth and its opponent to test the crown is contact but is not high. Less accurate, 40 mm thick, but more manageable myelometric strips used for composite restorations are sometimes an acceptable alternative. The next, study cast. Unarticulated study casts are used for assessing the stability of occlusion in ICP and for examining wear facets, which are often easier to see on the cast than in the mouth. They are of little value in assessing context and excursions of mandible. It is important that the casts are good quality with no air bubble or blips on the occlusal surfaces of teeth and that they are trimmed distally to allow the teeth to come into contact. If carefully used, alginate impression may be adequate, but alternatively, the cast should be produced from conventional silicon or polyethylene impression materials used for impressions of the crown preparations. Articulated study cast. When sufficient information cannot be obtained by clinical examinations or examinations of the handheld study cast, it is Unlikely that the study cast mounted on a simple hinge articulator will give adequate additional information. A semi-adjustable or fully adjustable articulator is necessary. The picture shows a setup study cast being mounted on a semi-adjustable articulator. 
for registration of the accusant, the following are required. A faceable record which records the relationship of the maxillary piece to the terminal hinge axis in the three dimensions. A record of RCP in one of the registration materials. Sometimes an RCP record is not needed and the ICP record is sufficient or the interdigitation of the cast is clear and the stable and low intercruiser record is needed. Protrusive excursion record and lateral excursion records are also needed. The semi-adjustable articulator has a number of limitations and produces only an approximation of the tooth movements in the mouse. However, for most purposes, it is quite sufficient. Now, move on to the occlusal adjustment prior to tooth preparation. Once the occlusion has been assessed, the adjustment prior to tooth preparation must be considered. This may be necessary in cases where the teeth opposing a proposed bridge have over-erupted or where the occlusal plane is going to be altered by the means of crowns. If the tooth is to be prepared has an occlusal interference, it should be adjusted prior to starting the preparation to ensure that there is a sufficient enamel and dentin remaining for the final preparation to be completed without endangering the pulp. Adequate tooth preparation for the proper thickness of the occlusal crown material is necessary. Otherwise, there is a risk that it, the interference will be reproduced. Sometimes the incisor plane of the lower incisors is adjusted and leveled out before making upper incisor crowns. Occlusal adjustment is also indicated in many cases of mandibular dysfunction. There is no justification for prophylactic adjustment unless there is evidence of damage or pathology arising from the occlusion. Our level of understanding of our occlusal problem is not yet sufficient to warrant arbitrary prophylactic alterations in an established, comfortable, functioning occlusion. Occlusal objectives in making crown and bridges. There are two main objectives. To leave the occlusion with no additional occlusal interference, in other words, harmonious. And the next is the, to leave the occlusion stable. In addition, there may be a secondary objectives. For example, number one, to distribute the guidance in one of the excursions more evenly between a number of teeth, for example, by modifying the anterior guidance so that a number of anterior teeth shares the occlusal forces in protrusive excursion. Number two, when a canine teeth that previously guided the occlusion is extracted, lateral force should be distributed as evenly as widely as possible between the remaining posterior teeth. These latter objectives may be described as occlusal engineering planned to produce occlusal relationships that achieve the first two major objectives of occlusal harmony and stability. Most crown and small bridges made in mouth with unestablished RCP and ICP these should be left unaltered by the restoration. In other words, a comfortive approach, unless, number one, so many of the occluding surfaces are being restored that ICP will inevitably be altered. Number two, ICP is unsatisfactory for some reason. Number three, occlusal vertical dimension is being altered. The finally, there are symptoms of TMD, temporal mandibular dysfunction. In all these cases, the occlusion is usually restored with an ICP made to coincide with the RCP. In other words, a rail organized approach. This is mostly for practical reasons and does not imply that the RCP is preferable to an established, comfortable, functional ICP. The reorganized occlusion is established either at a vertical dimension, which the dentist considers is close to the original vertical dimension, or more commonly, at an increased occlusal vertical dimension to replace the lowest OVD occlusal vertical dimension and to allow sufficient interocclusal space for the restoration to be made. With all major reconstructions, well made provisional restorations should be won for sufficient time to establish that the new occlusal vertical dimension and the occlusal functional relationships are comfortable. This is usually between three and six months. Now, let's talking about the clinical and laboratory management of occlusion. 
The first, we are discussing about the avoiding the loss of occlusal relationships. When sufficient occluding teeth it will remain to register the ICP and other occlusal relationships after tooth preparation, there is no need to take any precautions to record the occlusal relationship beforehand. However, when the occlusal surface is being removed from a number of teeth or when one or more of these teeth are crucial to the guidance of the mandibular movements, the occlusal relationships should be registered before the tooth preparation are begun. When large number of postator teeth are being prepared or when several teeth are missing, there is a risk of losing any record of original occlusal vertical dimension. A pair of opposing tooth on either side may be left unprepared, the remaining teeth prepared, and then the opposing teeth adjusted so that the ICP is the same as the RCP. Impressions and occlusal record are taken with these teeth stabilizing the jaw during the occlusal registrations. They are then prepared and further impressions are taken. Alternatively, one pair of opposing crowns can be made for each side of the arch before and other teeth are prepared and these pairs of crowns are serve as the same purpose. Maintaining occlusal relationships with temporary restorations. Prepared teeth and their opponents will over erupt unless occlusion is re-established by means of adequate temporary restorations. And the prepared teeth and the teeth either side of it can drift together unless contact points are maintained in this way. The longer the period between the impressions and teeth fitting the restorations, the more important are temporary restorations. They are probably also more important in younger patients where tooth movement may occur more quickly. For this reason, individually made temporary restorations in plastic are preferred to preformed types unless the preformed temporary restorations happens to be an excellent fit at the contact points and in the occlusion. The next topic is the recording the occlusion. A decision must be made on the type of articulator to use for this working cast. Once this is done, the appropriate occlusal record will be obvious. The choice is between the following four options. Number one, handheld models. These are not usually satisfactory. The most common problem is that the posterior restorations are made high and are not detected because it is very difficult to see the tiny spaces between pairs of opposing teeth adjacent to the restorations. It is unfortunately common that the carefully contoured occlusal surfaces of the posterior crown has to be adjusted at the chair side because the crown is high. The most common reasons for this is to use the handed working cast. The adjustment is time consuming, frustrating and damaging to the patient's confidence in the dentist. It is much better to give clear instructions to the laboratory to use an appropriate articulator. This will be more time consuming in the laboratory, which may therefore change more, but will often save clinical times and patient respect, both more valuable than the laboratory time. The number two, the second option, same simple hinge articulator. This is adequate when there is a sufficient unprepared intercuspating teeth and the restoration is to be made occluding in ICP. For example, in a straightforward single upper anterior crown, the partial surface can be contoured to match the adjacent palatal surface so that the incisal guidance will need a very little adjustment. Similarly, for a single restoration crown when the occlusion is canine guided, it is necessary only to reproduce the contact in ICP. The crown will disclude the lateral and protrusive excursions. The major advantage of hinge articulator over handheld model is that if the restoration is made high on a working cast, this can be identified and adjusted prior to trying the restoration in the patient's mouth. Sometimes there is no need for any occlusal record. It is often possible to place the models together entirely satisfactorily in ICP. When there may be some doubt about ICP, an occlusal record is made in wax or one of the other materials. The next is the semi-adjustable articulator. These have the following features. 
The condyles are on the lower member of the articulator and the condyla guidance element is on the upper membrane. In other words, an archon type design. The intercondylar distance is variable. The maxillary cast is related to the approximation of the terminal hinge axis through the condyles. Condylar guidance is variable but only in straight lines. Some adjustment of the incisor guidance is usually possible. When occlusal relationships are important in positions other than the ICP, a semi-adjustable articulator should be used. The maxillary cast is mounted using a, the face bow, and the mandibular cast is related to it by hand in ICP, by an ICP record or by a record of the RCP, whichever is appropriate. The articulator is then adjusted using intraocclusal record taken in either protrusive or lateral excursions. The record taken will be selected according to the circumstances. For example, if crowns on the right side are being made in a case with grouped functions, but where there is no risk of non-working side contacts occurring in the left lateral excursions, only a record of right lateral excursion is necessary. With this arrangement, a good approximation of group function should be possible with only minor adjustment being necessary at the chair side because of the compromises inherent with semi-adjustable articulators. There are two broad categories of semi-adjustable articulator, archon and non-archon. The articulator shown in this picture is a semi-adjustable archon articulator and the fully adjustable articulators will be shown afterward. It is also an archon design. The type shown in this picture is an non-archon type, that is the balls representing the condyles are related to the upper member of the articulator and the condylar guidance to the lower. This is of course upside down with respect to the anatomy of the joint. The picture depicts the non-archon articulator, another type. In practical terms, the difference between the archon and non-archon design is not particularly relevant provided that the occlusal record can be taken with the teeth in contact or nearly so. However, if the occlusal vertical dimension is being increased or if the occlusal records have to be taken at the degree of opening in the mandible, then this affects the relationship between the condylar guidance angle and the upper member of the articulator. It follows that in these circumstances, an archon design should be used. The next one is the fully adjustable articulator. A full description of the use of these articulators and the additional records needed to use them is beyond the scope of this class. The next topic is the laboratory stages. Trimming the cast, one of the commonest causes of restoration being high when tried in the mouse is distortion of the cast, particularly the opposing cast, which may be made from an arginate impression. Commonly, a small air bubble trapped in the occlusal fissures will prop the model apart slightly so that if the restoration is made to touch the opposing model, it will be high in the mouse. Impression techniques for crowns and bridges should be concentrated on the crowns of the teeth, injecting impression material into the occlusal fissures or rubbing arginate into them with the fingers. If air bubbles do occur, great care should be taken to trim the occlusal defects from the models and if individual teeth are suspect, they should be cut right away from the model unless they are opposing or adjacent to the teeth being restored. And then the articulating the cast, as small an amount of plaster is possible should be used since the expansion of the plaster distorts the relationship of articulator with the cast. Impression plaster or plaster containing an anti-expansion agent should be used. Alternatively, there is a plasterless design of the articulator. Shaping the occlusal surfaces. The technique of shaping the occlusal surfaces will depend upon whether the surface is to be metal or porcelain. With this technique, wax is built up to excess on the occlusal surfaces and then carved to the required occlusal contour. Small increments of wax are added when necessary to repair the overcarving. When completed, occlusal contact should be checked using shrimp stacks, both between the carved tooth and its opponent between adjacent teeth and their opponents.
the wax added technique. Small increments of the molten wax are flowed from the tip of the instrument to build up cones, each one forming the tip of the cusp. The other features of the cruiser surfaces are then added, often with different colored waxes to identify each feature. Using this technique, the cruiser relationships in all excursions can be checked from the beginning and adjusted as the process continues. Occlusal shaping with porcelain. Porcelain surfaces are built up slightly to excess and then grounded to shape, stained and glazed. Again, Shimtax or similar materials is used to check the occlusal relationships in the articulator. The next topic to be discussed is adjusting the occlusion of restoration in the mouse before cementation. We will discuss the occlusal marking materials, articulating papers and pores, and the 0.5 mm thick darkly colored wax have already been described. An alternative technique for metal occlusal surface is to grid blast them lightly with a mild abrasive, which gives the surface a matte appearance. Burnish mark will then appear in areas of contact with opposing teeth and the articular Pink papers will mark more clearly. For porcelain occlusal surfaces, especially with complex occlusions or multiple crowns, it is often best to adjust occlusion when the porcelain is in a biscuit bake stage prior to the final glaze. Adjusting in intercuspid position. A patient who does not have a local anesthetics will be immediately conscious of high restoration in ICP. Even with the local anesthetics, the opposing teeth will normally sense a high restoration. A patient will not, of course, be aware of the restoration that is short of occlusion, and so occlusal contact should be checked with shrimp stock or myelometric strip. If occlusal contact is not present, in other words, the restoration is not occlusally stable, the tooth or its opponent will over erupt and the occlusal interferences may be introduced. High restoration should usually be adjusted. However, occasionally a high posterior crown or a small bridge may be planned in advance in order to produce a tooth movement similar to tooth movement produced by a dart appliance in the anterior part of the mouth. This may be done, for example, when the tooth to be crowned is very short and little or no preparations of the occlusal surfaces is desirable. This tooth movement, as with a dart appliance, is preferably achieved with provisional restorations and the patients warned in advance. Patients really accept this as a part of planned treatment but, as stated earlier, resent it when it unplanned and appear to be a mistake. The next is the adjustment in the lateral protrusive and retrusive excursions. The occlusion of the restoration examined for interferences in these excursions of the mandible and adjusted if necessary. Some guide to the presence of possible interferences is whether the crown is displaced during the lateral and protrusive mandibular movement with the teeth in contact. So next, we should check the stability. Following these adjustments, a final check of the stability of the occlusion is made by confirmation of the presence of the centric stops on the restoration and the adjacent teeth. The adequacy of the contact point is checked with the dental floss. Now finally, we are talking about the adjustment techniques. ICP is adjusted first and the centric stops marked with articulating foil, paper, or wax. Interferences are marked with the different colors and adjusted. Metal and porcelain can be adjusted with mounted stones or diamond bars. Metals can be finished with finishing burrs and polished with mounted rubber wheels or points. Porcelain can be finished with the mounted points or discs used to finish composite and with specially produced sets of the instrument. With this instrument, the finished surface is as smooth as glazed surface and reglazing is unnecessary. Thank you for listening. See you next week.